welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm thank thrilled you. to have each and every one of you. It is hump day and I cannot believe that it is like almost mid month. So where did the year go? Have no idea, but today we are spending our time with Sherry Quam Taylor and Sherry will be talking to us about top year end nonprofit strategies. Thrilled to have Sherry back with us and we will hear from her here shortly. Make sure you know who you're talking to and who you're listening to. Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Um, thank you for creating this wonderful opportunity, Julia, because these episodes have been phenomenal. Um, and it's just- Ooh, I thought you were going to say something else. <laughs> <laughs> phenomenal. Yeah. Um, so it's just been amazing to continue these conversations in a high level with thought leaders, provoking conversations. I'm so grateful to serve alongside you in this phenomenal, I just want to keep scaring you, <laughs> episode. Uh, I'm Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd, also known as Julia's private nonprofit nerd, uh, CEO of The Raven Group, and continued to express our gratitude to all of our presenting sponsors. These companies exist to help you do more good. They are here to lean in and elevate everything that you are doing in, throughout, and around your communities. If you have not checked them out, please, please do. These are your friends. They are on your team. They will help you reach your mission-driven goals. So please do uh, reach out to our presenting sponsors. We are so, so lucky to have them. Just as we are, Sherry Quam taylor Welcome back, Sherry. Thank you for having me. I was thrilled to get the email and uh, and get on your calendar so quickly. Yeah. You know, we have always, we don't get to have you on enough, but Aww. when we do, we get like super excited <laughs> and because we just love what you have to say. Thank you. Feelings mutual. Feelings mutual. Oh my gosh. Well, it's really cool. Check out Quam Taylor. Make sure you get on Sherry's email list. She's this really interesting pieces that she sends out that I find very inspirational. She talks about different things going on. Um, so yeah, don't miss Thank that. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to talk about, we only have 30 minutes to talk about something so huge, but that's finishing the year strong. You've got four main tips and tip number one, segment your donors, segment again. Okay. I know I have to talk fast on this show. We're going to get it all in. <laughs> okay. No now, pressure. I don't need to tell anybody, probably the two of you are listening, that we need to treat our $25,000 donors different from our $25 donors. It doesn't mean one is more important than the other. You know, don't, we, I'm not saying that, but our goal is that each one of our donors would be given their best gift to the organization and to lead them to give that best gift every year. So that's the job we have to do. Now, Sometimes we are actually the ones that get in the way of that. And a lot of that aligns with our, our early, what do you call that? The, the pre-chitty chat. A lot of that aligns with our Marcom and how we are maybe kind of doing a one size fits all communication approach to every part of, I'm always going to have a pyramid up, every part of the pyramid. And so how we communicate to that $25 donor, maybe they're giving $25 a month, is very different. Um, there's a different reason that they're giving than maybe an individual donor who writes a $25,000 check every year. But I see so much money left on the table when we are doing a one size fits all and everybody's kind of getting the same envelope at year end. Everybody's getting the same insert. And uh, we kind of wonder why they just kind of keep giving the same amount every year. And so, you know, the top part of the pyramid, the higher we go up, the more uh, exclusive I want that to feel, the more customized I want that to be. Um, they have different needs. Okay, so I got to ask this question because in the Chitty Chat chat, we were bemoaning the fact that too many development directors are also taking on marketing and communications. You'll hear us call it MarComs. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're trying to figure out how to communicate to this this pyramid that you're talking about. Do I also hear you saying then that we need to bring somebody in to help us craft those messages and, and that strategy or so, should yeah. that be led by the development director? 
Well, it depends on staffing, but I got to tell you, if you have an amazing writer who understands fundraising, understands donor segmentation, I have mine that I recommend because she gets fundraising and is an excellent storyteller communicator. Okay. Um, they have, they should be able, like, as you're getting ready to say, here's our, let's, let's say it's a mailed appeal. Here's our mailed appeal. Maybe there's a little insert letter. Um, you might have five. Okay. Let's say three different <laughs> versions of that letter. And, oh, and okay. yeah, my heart just went, uh-oh. I know, I know. But Ooh. if I want, do I want a monthly donor to hear your steady giving for the last few years has allowed us to, you know, that's a confidence knowing that so much money is coming in every month. Um, and, and they need, they need to be told that like, even though that might be a small gift, gosh, we, we greatly depend on that. Same as, you know, maybe a family foundation hearing something different or an individual donor um, hearing that like they're a stakeholder, uh, we're in partnership. So there is a different tone that needs to happen. And you must take the time to align not only what you're saying, but the channel that you're saying it. You know, silly example would be like, we don't go on Facebook and say, I'm looking for a major donor today. Who can give me 50K? You know, that's the wrong channel, right? right? So it's, it, I'll tell you, we get in the way when we don't take the time to really segment our appeals and what they look like and the messaging and the ask to align with their giving profile. Well, and what I'm hearing you say also, Sherry, is that will help to increase our return on relationships. So we're showing, which then increases our ROI, we're showing the value we're demonstrating where we're literally using words that demonstrate that return on relationships. So having this segmentation, so segment and segment again is tip number one, and having three, maybe five of these, <laughs> of these different, different letters, I think really goes to show that we know our donors, we yes. know our donors, and that will increase, I think, them, to use your words, to make that best gift year after year. Yeah. And if, and if anybody fell off the chair, when I said five letters, like, I mean, here's the first step. If you're like, we've never done that. Yeah. Take one segment and pull it out and customize it. Okay. Pick like one that. segment, start there. Like we don't need to go zero to a hundred and you know, 20 year one, take one segment and speak to them, speak to their needs, speak to why they're giving, speak to, you know, their mission for giving start there. Start Love there. It. Okay. So then tip number two, make time for FaceTime. Okay. Oh my goodness. Whew. FaceTime has changed on how we, we look at that. Um, but yet, what are your thoughts on this? Cause it, yes. it, it has changed and it is changing. It is changing. And aren't we trying to stay on the pulse of this? Okay. I'm going to say something uh, really bold that ties to even like what we just talked about, but if, if people didn't fall off their chair before, maybe this is the fall off the chair. Um, not everyone, not all of your donors should get your year end appeal. Okay. Yeah. I know. okay. I my hair is on fire now. <laughs> tell, tell me more. Yeah. I know. I'm here's not quite drinking the Kool-Aid, but tell here's, me more. Here's what I mean by that. Like I, I should have a little diagram instead of my, my pyramid. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So here's the thing. I want your top level donors. Let's say your top 30 donors. That's where I, you know, that ladies, that's where I focus my time. Mm -hmm. They need to be asked. They need to be solicited. You need to be sitting down one-on-one, -on -one, leading them through a stakeholder conversation, talking about an investment level gift every year. Don't, can I say wimp out or don't, don't cheat <laughs> by just sending the appeal to everybody. That one version of that, those five letters, three letters that I just said yeah. for your top 30 donors, it might just say, we're so glad we're in partnership with you. Thank you. We, we, we can't wait to meet after the first year and share with you what your gift is doing. Those people need to be asked. And the number of organizations who are not taking the time to sit down and solicit their donors, whether it be in person, whatever state you're in, whether it be, uh, you know, in uh, on Zoom or FaceTime, whatever it looks like, the number of donors or fundraisers that are not taking the time to sit down and ask for that donor's best gift blows me away every day. And you're not getting their best gift. Okay. Now I'm drinking the Kool-Aid and I yeah, get what you're saying. Cause I thought, 
Me too. What in the world? Like, <laughs> Julia, cut it. Drop her now. Whatever, <laughs> whatever you She's need. She's never to coming her. again. Yeah, bring this shepherd's hook. But I get it. And I'm going to tell you, and I'm curious um, if you've seen this, Sherry, especially as we talked about in the Chitty Chat Chat. So those of you that missed the Chitty Chat Chat, oh, you missed some really golden nuggets. Yeah. Um, what, during this great resonation, and there's a lot on so many development officers' plates, mm-hmm. I have seen more passive fundraising tactics being employed. So that is the email, that is the annual appeal, that is you know, social media post. And I keep telling my clients, passive is okay, but you have to take this active approach. So are you seeing that, Sherry? And is that why really this, you know, face face to face, whether it's virtual, um, is really that best strategy to get the best gift? Yeah, I see that all the time. And we're not saying that those types of things aren't important. They're they're hugely important, but they're important for this group down here. And so if, I mean, I I don't know, I've never had a fundraiser who has extra hours in the day. And so I want your top 30 donors yielding yielding between 50 and 75% of your revenue. So where do you need to spend your time? Um, And those are one-on-one asks. So I find that we're spending all of our time to attract and secure gifts through a lot of digital marketing, which actually yield yield and attract gifts that are small, again, important, but it cannot be the entire strategy. Um, yeah, it's because one piece of the puzzle, it's one piece, as one you piece of the about puzzle. strategy. So carve out time. Do you think it's your top 30? Cause I heard you say like, like, look at your yeah. top 30. I, I'm assuming that number changes, but like Bloomerang has a wonderful report. Um, who's hot and who's not as well as that. Bloomerang. Yeah. It has nothing to do with their physical appearance. It has everything to do with their engagement level, right? <laughs> and maybe physical appearance, but it really has this engagement tracking ability. Most CRMs do or will. And so you can identify who are our top committed, loyal, yeah. as we call those here on our show, our raving fans. Yeah. Who are our raving fans? Yeah, you nailed it. And I think it's also like yeah, it's not like, oh, we only have 29, so this strategy doesn't work. It's also a mindset of yeah, it's a mindset. Yeah, like these are these are people who, you know, perhaps are giving the largest gifts to our organization. And, you know, they need to be communicated differently too. And so it actually is a it's it's a relationship building thing. It's a um it's so many things, but I will tell you that most people, a lot of fundraisers just haven't ever learned how to do that. How would I sit down with somebody and like talk about, we have a $3 million need this year. Like, do I understand the tough, the answers to the tough questions? Um, But I want you sitting down, having investment level conversations. People need to know how you're funded, how you were funded last year, what your budget looks like. It's not saying don't tell stories and don't do all the amazing, you know, communicating about your mission, but major donors are dying for more information. And they're dying to know what impact their gift can make. And there's only one person who can tell them. I love it. That's a fundraiser. Okay. Now, so one and two blew me away. <laughs> like I said, we always- and she's already out of her chair. I mean- <laughs> I know. My heart is racing and my hair is on fire, but in a good way. Okay. Tip number three, the number one thing to do when thanking donors. And I have to tell everybody the backstory for this. Um, as you figured out, we have our chitty chat chat. We'll communicate before with our guests before they come on. Sherry would not tell me what this is. <laughs> so oh. Jerry and I, this is going to be like, okay, what is it, sister? I don't know. So here's my, this is what I'm like, pens up. Anybody writing anything, put it on the post-it. I've got post-its okay. all over. Yeah, ready. So my phone. here's it. It's, it's more like, here's my number one rule. Yes. Exceed expectations. Okay. If you get somebody saying, oh my gosh, you didn't need to do that. Glorious. And the reason I say that is because, I mean, we could all tell a a horror story on thanking or like, oh, that didn't, oh, my name was misspelled or, oh, I just got the, I just got the cookie cutter, like, you know, blah, blah receipt. This is the biggest misstep in the donor experience. Just like, and, and the reason I say that is the bar is so low in thanking. I, I'm going to be a little frank. Gladly. Yes. Bar is so low. And this is how we retain donors. We want best gift, 
every year. Well, how are we going to get the gift every year if it's like uh, cookie cutter, you know, like it wasn't, it wasn't, it was a, a print of the signature. The bar is too low. Just like where we started this talking about uh, appeals and donor experience per donor segment. I want you to thank per donor segment too. Are you taking the time to customize based on their mission for giving? Are you taking the time to say, let's give an extra five minutes to this. And let me mention that personal conversation I had with them. Uh, Let me actually bring up, I don't know, their parents that we were talking about or that their parents, so, you know, we've known them for a decade. Are you customizing it based on why they would give Uh, or do they feel like "Eh, everybody got this? Nobody wants to feel like that. Are we still using handwritten notes on like, let's say you use a cookie cutter template um, to streamline some of the activity and then handwriting notes, signatures, sticky notes, things like that? hundred percent. Like I'm a big uh, handwritten, you know, I mean, probably because it's a lot of it is a lost art. Um, but, but it, and, it, and what I'm not saying is we should be buying people gold watches or any of that kind of stuff. Um, it needs to be mission appropriate, but it's easier to customize the thanking, um, when we have taken the time to truly, truly understand why that donor gave and how our mission aligns with their story and what would make them give again and really why we deeply value their partnership. The thanking and impact reporting must match that. And I just, I just feel like this is the area where we're all busy. We're all busy. And it's like, are the thank yous out? Okay. On to the next thing. Get it done. Get it done. I know I've been in that place before, but um, you know, the, the retention statistics are like off the charts fun on, you know, quick thank yous and customized thank yous and the board writing a, a handwritten note mm-hmm. off the charts. I wish I had the number in front of me. Um, so take the time and exceed expectations. Um, one other tip, I'll just, can, if I have time to give a tip. Yeah, yeah. I have had huge success, especially in these last 20 plus months. I've had huge success in this area in with family foundations and actually corporate sponsorships. You know why? Because oftentimes I'll say, how did we thank that family foundation? Well, they, they don't require anything. They, they, they don't work. Yeah. So what did we send them? Did we, how did we report impact? So I want you to exceed expectations. I want you to then take the time and be like, I'm going to make a 60 second video and tell them what their gift is doing. And I am going to send it to them because next year when those applications come around, who, who do we remember? Who's, whose application goes to the top of the stack? So don't treat family foundations and even corporations who are sponsoring your events or whatever. Don't treat them like banks. Take the time and exceed their expectations. Your Thank name will go to the top of the list. Thank you, Sherry, because I have heard yes. that also yeah. time and time again, that, you know, just what you said, they don't require anything. Okay, but we still need to inform. We still need to keep this relationship going. And I love that. Thank you for for sharing that tip. If if our viewers heard nothing but that, that is an immense takeaway. (laughs) Good. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. I love it. Yeah. Now, hard to believe because our time is drawing to a close, which freaks me out because I'm always just like, no, no, we want more time with Sherry. But you've got tip number four, and I can see a lot of these things that you've talked about are putting us towards this direction. How do we set up for an even bigger gift next year? Yes. Okay. So here's here's what I do. So I told you best gift every year. So every every time someone gives a gift, how we respond to it is obviously setting us up for that next gift. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, one of the biggest complaints I hear is, oh, I don't know. They, they gave that gift and like, we just never heard from them again. I don't know. They came, we didn't hear from them. So I want, I want everybody listening to hear, like you have more control, not a bad control, but you have, have more control over this than you think. And so I want you to understand this concept of you need to lead the donor to their next step. The only way you can lead is if you know what the next step is. So even on this example, take those top 10 donors who give at year end, maybe you're just sending an appeal. Okay, whatever. 
on the thank you, I want you to tell them what you're going to do next. I am so excited to share with you what your gift is doing. I hope you have a wonderful holiday and I will circle back with you the first week of March to share with you what your gift is doing. Looking forward to it. Well, you just told them what you're going to do next. And then I'm going to lead them. And and so now, oh, they're going to call me in March. All right, that's fine. That'd be great. That's good timing. Lead them and tell them what you're going to do next. And then tell them what their gift's been doing. No one else is doing that. And so then how do you start cultivating? And in that case, if they responded to the appeal, um, in that case, I would work. You, you just bought yourself from March until November to lead that donor to a one-on-one ask and a solicitation and hopefully an opportunity to grow that gift to their best gift. So why are we waiting till March? You know what? I said March because sometimes I'll say 90 days. You okay. know, I just kind of threw March up there. Um, sometimes... Um, or like I'll say February, if it's like kind of one of those sleeper months where it's like, you know, we're all exhausted from all the year in giving and it's like, we're back at our desk. Um, I'm just saying whatever month that is, you know, I sometimes I'll put it out 90 days, put it out 60 days, just so everybody knows what the next step in that donor experience is. And so, so curious, curiosity, right. Um, is this also based off of the segmentation? So every segment, every donor kind of has that 90 day cadence. You know, I, you know, you know, I work at the top of the pyramid, so I'm, I'm kind of probably very specifically talking about the top of the pyramid because okay. we wouldn't say, I can't wait to respond to you in 90 days on like a $25 donor, or right. we need a staff of 400 doing this. Um, so again, I'll just segment and say, right how, how am I responding to them? Or maybe with, you know, let's say everybody who gave 500 and under, mm-hmm. can't wait to share with you this, uh, watch for that email coming out in here that talks about our spring blah, yeah. like you, we've got to lead them and tell them what's coming next so that they stay engaged. Mm-hmm. We've got to hold that control a little bit tighter. So it doesn't float off to la la land and some years they give and some years they don't, mm-hmm. you have control of that. And then we have to do it, right? Like, okay. so if we say we're going to follow up in March or whatever that date is, we, we need in the to- calendar, <laughs> in the calendar, it's like open Google calendar right now, put it in. Yeah, absolutely. But lead the donor is what I'm saying there. Lead the donor to their, to a better gift mm-hmm. every year. Well, in that way, it's not a surprise. I know I've heard from so many development professionals saying, oh my gosh, I have so much anxiety about reaching out to this donor. But what you just shared, Sherry, is this ability to seed this conversation will be coming up. And that to me, it takes away any mystery and it is setting the path, setting the tone and really being clear on what the donor can expect through their journey. I love it. Yeah. And and you don't need a script for that because you could, Hey, I know I said I'd follow up in March. So I just want to give you a quick buzz and let you know, you know, yeah. Tell a story, right? This is where it's like, if it's the heartfelt donor, we're going to tell a story. If it's the CFO, it's like, you know what? I'm going to send this to you. I got a one pager. That's these amazing metrics. I thought you would like, and I'm going to send it to you after this, after this call, Mm -hmm. you know, speak, speak their language. It doesn't have to be a 32 page report on gift impact. Nor should it be, right? Nor should it be. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I guess that was obvious, but yeah, you're right. <laughs> it's you know, so important. I, I love this because I think to kind of echo what Jared just said was that it then puts your team um, on a trajectory of knowing what's moving forward as opposed to like, okay, whew, first of the year, now what do we do? Right. You are building a cadence and a rhythm towards how you're working. Yes. And to your point, it's getting on the calendar. It's it's moving into your goals and your measurements. It's a logical um, path to maintaining the stewardship. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to like, okay, we we have this big thing and we're exhausted. Okay, now totally. start from zero. Yeah, and you know, great thing for a board member to do. Yes. You know what? Oh my gosh. We know that because, you know, Chris introduced us to as a board member for four years. Uh, Chris, you know, we're going to put on the calendar. Uh, let's just chat real quick. And then you're going to call the donor and tell them what their gift's been doing. Yeah. I mean, how easy is that? Again, your board member does not need a script. If they're engaged, they should be able to tell a story or they should have 
you know, some they've gathered something from some mission minute that they had in their meeting, but they're just saying, you know, and then, and then tell them what you're going to do next. Right. right. It's like, and then say, great, well, I'll have, I'll have Jared reach out to you here in the next few months before you go on that trip, tell them what you're going to do next. Right. So it's, it's so simple. Um, but this, this whole, like, we don't have control of when they engage with us is you do. And that's why I always say you have way more control of the gift size and the timing of the gift than you think if you're leading correctly. So I have a question and I want you now to take out that crystal ball that I'm sure you have behind you on that shelf, or I'm hoping you do. Um, And I'm curious if you can just, you know, impromptu speak about what you've seen in regards to philanthropy for this specific Q4, Mm because we were all on edge last year for Q4 and really not knowing what was going to, to happen we saw philanthropy increase. We saw the, the amount of people giving, we saw an increase of the people giving like that constituency base yeah. grew. What are you seeing and what, what is in this crystal ball that you have Sherry that maybe yeah. look forward to? Well, my crystal ball says um, that, that I'm seeing everybody, everybody has continued to work really hard and it's continued to say, we're not doing it the old way. We're breaking the sector's misconceptions. We're pushing into new ways of doing things that frankly, we knew we should have been doing all along. Um, and so I, I see people, I guess that's, I see donors responding to that. I see donors still responding to, oh gosh, thank, thank goodness we're not having that gala again. We didn't like going to that anyhow. Can I say to that? Can I say that? Say that. So if, if you've been doing the hard work and you've been leading your donors out of transactional gifts into mission space gifts, which everybody should be doing mm-hmm. so that you don't have to do that event again, or it gets to be a great cultivation or donor enrollment event. Amazing. Yeah. Those people who have said, I'm making a change with my funding model and our activities and maybe my work chart, they're going to still see solid gifts because they've been doing the hard work to really lead those transactional donors into relationships and mission-based gifts. And so I don't see gifts tapering off. You know, I've never had more organizations fully funded way before the year end, never in my life. Wow. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Okay. Well, you're just a rock star. Jared and I, (laughs) oh my God, Jared and I get so excited on the rare occasion that we get to get you to ourselves for 30 minutes and we got to just cram all this stuff in but here's sherry's information i mean what a powerhouse i learned so much from you i'm reminded of things that i need to be rethinking um i'm reminded of things that i know deep in my heart work and that are natural i love 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 your attitude and so here is sherry's information quam taylor Thank you for having me. I really do love being on with you guys. Oh my gosh. It's just the best. I mean, and even the chitty chat chat was good today. Oh my God. It was good. It was good. Yeah. (laughs) We might have to pull that out. You know, we might have to. I know. Next next time's topic. Next time's topic. (laughs) Yeah, this is true. This is true. Well, hey, everybody. Again, I'm Julia Patrick. I've been joined by the nonprofit nerd herself, Jarrett Ransom, CEO of the Raven Group. Again, we want to thank all of our sponsors. I mean, our sponsors get behind us because we have people like Sherry Quam Taylor on. And so super cool. It it just is like, wow, Jarrett, what a great message today. Every day. I love our shows every day. I'm I'm always learning something new, but this is like gets to the meat and potatoes. It does. And it's a critical time right now. Q4. I mean, it's, you know, we're down to the wire. I don't even know how it's October 2021 already, but it is. And as I said, it, you know, it's, it's hump day of the week. It's kind of like hump day of the Q4. I can't, I cannot believe it. <laughs> it is. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. yeah thank you, Sherry. And thanks to all of our presenting sponsors that allow us these unscripted opportunities. I, Julia, you had said this before, like we are not governed by what we say or who we have on from our sponsors. Our sponsors are very generous and give us the autonomy to bring and, you know, have people say, people are tired of going to your galas. They were ready for this shakeup. <laughs> it's true. Don't hurt me, event people. 
<laughs> I like a good gala. I do. I do. But you know what I mean. You know what I mean. I don't know. I can't get into any of my ball gowns right now. So <laughs> it's probably a good thing that we're not in gala season. Hey, everybody. <clears throat> what a great day. Make it a great day for yourself and for your organization. And remember, as we end every show, we always like to really witness to you. Stay well so you can do well. We have a lot to do. We'll see you back here tomorrow, everyone. Thanks, Sherry. 